All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Ray Payne. I'm the executive director of the conductor. Um, for those of you that don't know us, those who are joining us online, and we are both our partnership with UCA, and our mission is to empower and inspire current and aspiring entrepreneurs, innovators, and small business leaders. And so we do that through events like this, through one-on-one -on -one consults, uh, through our subject matter expert network, which all of these ladies are a part of. Um, and then we also have a new loan program, but our goal is to lower barriers to be starting and growing a business. And so with that, I'll kick off our banking on success panel. We have three successful business women here talking about that are in the banking industry that are going to talk to us about small business banking. So I'll throw it over to you guys and want you to introduce yourselves, talk a little bit about your background in the bank system. So Lori, I'll throw it to you. Lori, I'll throw it to you. Oh, you the wise old owl. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my name is Lori Case Melton. I have been a banker in Conway for 37 plus years. Um, I think. Possibly, I am the longest tenured now that Margaret retired. I don't know. There might be. We may have somebody up there. I don't know. I, I need to. I need to go get our calendars together and see because at some point I'm going to claim that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm with First Community Bank. Um, we are in temporary quarters right now, but we're the ones that are building the big building kind of next to um, CBS. So. I do business development there, but of course, over my 37 year period, I have done a lot of things. I am Michelle Phillips. I am new to banking, actually. Just since um, April, I joined First Security Bank. However, I'm a certified public accountant and I have been in that industry for about 25 years. 12 of those years, I um, owned and operated my CPA firm. Sold that about two years ago, took a little time off, and then got into the banking world. My name is Melanie Moore. I'm a community banker at Simmons Bank here in Conway. Um, Lori, I have to give credit to her, actually helped me get into banking. Um, what, five, six years? I don't know how long. I have a lot of those around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I spent four years of my career at Regions on the retail side of banking, and I've been with Simmons for almost two. Um, on the commercial side, so um, newer to the commercial side, but I've worked with both of these ladies in different positions, so I'm excited just to, to sit up here with both of them. And we're all great. Yes, <laughs> that's very important. We'll get into that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm excited about that. So I have some questions we're going to start out with, and then I'll throw it out to the audience. If anybody joins us online, you're welcome to throw questions in the chat, and Mallory will lob those over to us. Um, but I want to start out with some components on business banking. Um, focus on kind of accounts and then we'll go into some financing questions. But um, I'll start with what are some key factors that small business owners should consider when choosing um, a bank for their business? I personally think um, one, uh, on the, you need to meet a lender. You always need to have that relationship with a, a loan officer because even if you don't need one, I mean, certainly will it probably as your business grows. Uh, they become a, a confidant, a business partner for you. And it's okay to interview them. You know, you need to have one that you get along with really well and that you feel cares as much about your business as you do uh, and understands your line of business. Um, I mean, can you imagine going, if you had a difficult financial business and you could go to someone that was a CPA, that's, you know, that's a huge advantage when uh, we were talking, I was talking to Michelle about about it. I was like, oh my gosh, you'll be such a resource for, for a small business uh, to be able to do that. My background is marketing, so I actually can bring, you know, some things like that. So uh, every lender, even if you've been a lender for a long time, you may have a little expertise. You may do more construction type or, uh, and just um, make sure you feel comfortable because you, you need that relationship. Um, to last for a long time. I would second all of that. And I mean, of course, convenience is a, can be a big thing, but really just getting that personal service with your person. You know, you, you, would, you will find your person at the bank, most likely a lender, but it doesn't always have to be. Have to be. Um, Since I, I don't loan money, but I do have people that come and talk to me about the business. Absolutely. But yeah, I think just... Making sure you have that personal relationship and you're able to pick up the phone and call Bill and and actually get 
do it first. Oh, third and second, <laughs> all of what they said. Um, but two, again, like I mentioned, being friends in the industry, and I think there's a misconception out there that like bankers don't like other bankers, but we do because you have different banks that may be better at construction. Some may be better at the, you know, working capital lines of credit type of thing, or just, you know, based off the lending guidelines of the bank, you know, you, there may be something I can't do, but, you know, I can tell my customer, my bank is not going to allow me to do this, but I know somebody that you will be in good terms with. So I think it's- We refer people back. Yes, absolutely. That's so it, I refer at least. Yeah, I think it's very important to not only, like she said, have that great relationship with your lender, but also trust that if they can't do something, that they're going to guide you in the right direction. That's awesome. And we, we saw that a lot with PPP, just having that relationship yes. with a lender. Don't say that. Everybody. I know. <laughs> I don't, not, not word, but I think that that was a cautionary tale in having a relationship with a banker and with your bank and why that that's important. Because like, you don't need it till you need it. And then you need it really badly. Um, well, and I, I'll mention something about that. Our bank uh, opened in November uh, of, 90, uh, of um, 19. So we had, didn't, here in Conway, we're a 25-year-old, 26-year-old bank, but, but in Conway. So when COVID happened and our doors were shut, you know, and all the other banks were doing PPP loans like crazy, and we're over here going, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we literally sat around the room and went, okay, who's being underserved on the PPP market? And we felt like um, minorities uh, of all kinds, uh, especially the Hispanic population that you can imagine trying to do if you're a business person and you're trying to do uh, something as difficult as a PPP loan in your in another language, how horrible that would be. Well, we had a great guy that spoke fluent Spanish and um so we went out and and went for that and uh, because of that uh, we probably have the largest percentage of minority customers in uh it wasn't like they were being turned away it was just um you know they didn't have that relationship already with their lender already established and so we got out in the middle of COVID and and actually worked on that and because we it was the timing uh, of it so that's another thing if you have something if you need to do something specific like that make sure you find that person i want to transition to talk a little bit about bank accounts for businesses so what are some business accounts that your bank specifically offers and then why is that different from a personal account and why do you need a business account for different businesses well, then, numbers person here. Okay. Let her start. Yeah. Um, as she far is going to tell you, it is <laughs> crucially important to not operate two businesses out of one account, a business and a personal account together. Um, I would say the biggest thing for that is taxes. Um, but also, when something goes wrong, you can't pinpoint the problem if you're operating multiple entities out of one account. Um, for Simmons, you know, we have lots of different types of business accounts. And being very honest, a lot of banks have the same type of accounts. I mean, we all pretty much do the same thing as far as our accounts go. Um, I would say one of the main things to look at would be the fees. Um, understand what the fees are. That's something that we commonly see is that somebody will come in and open up a business account. They don't know that you can sign up for e-statements and eliminate a $5 monthly fee. Um, they don't know that a business bundle and what it does and when it's going to be charged and, and, and lots of things like that. But I think that also goes back to finding that person that you trust who's going to explain those things and be very transparent about it. I can help guide you. Like, yes, having a separate checking account for your business is extremely important. Highly recommend that most cases it's not going to cost you anything if it does it's going to be minimal but having that separation of your personal and business or even your different businesses highly recommend separate accounts it just makes life so much easier for everyone involved including your tax preparer you um we're gonna, i know we'll get into a little bit later of, of some of the bookkeeping items but um, very important. And it, a lot of times if you have an LLC as a business or a corporation, if you're operating all of that 
along with your personal, the IRS or other people, like if someone's trying to, to sue you for some reason, having that business alone is not going to help protect you from liability. You have to actually operate it as a business, which means having its own checking account, keeping your personal business separate from your actual business. Yeah, I'm going to add this ugly word that you may not have heard or phrase, and that is earnings credit. Um, because you have you're never going to figure out what how to get an earnings credit because i can't explain it either I'm really good but so it, depending on what type of account you have um businesses aren't allowed to earn on a regular checking account you're not allowed to earn interest and so we charge a fee and then we basically give you credit back for whatever your your deposit volume is and that's called an earnings credit and it's calculated on your daily balance and then but i could uh that's about that yeah, 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 yeah but it's so it is a way to get your fees paid while you're not earning interest uh so it, just because you see a fee on a check account doesn't always mean you're paid. and i would say too with business accounts a lot of the difference in how to choose one has to do with your transaction volume and the balance in your account. Um, a lot of accounts, I think across the board at all banks, you keep a certain amount, we avoid a fee monthly. Um, if you have e statements, paper statements, um, a lot of times business accounts will also have that added um, analysis statement, which is a lot more information than just looking at like your electronic check register. So that, I think that's really things that you need to look at is fees. You know how many transactions you can do per month which a lot of times if you exceed that say you can do 50 transactions a month you exceed that it's very minute what you're going to get charged um, but that's when you have a good banker that sees you're getting that charge and says hey i think we need to change you to a different account type because it looks like your business is growing and you got a little bit more volume than you used to. and it, and it's what those transactions look like mm -hmm. are you putting money in the uh um, remote deposit capture do you even have a little scanner on your desk where you're sending if you get checks or is it all electronic um who are who's sending your money to you electronically uh who are you sending money out to um, and i'm i'm not going to get into the details of that but uh, a lot of that will come in the security piece but um but just be prepared when you come in to talk to open up an account to you know know how what you really need uh how your money is going to come in and out and the banker can recommend what's best for you and i agree the products at the banks are going to be very yeah. similar i wasn't about to try to explain all of those to you so i brought brochures for personal and She's some business products. <laughs> yeah. um because you guys know all of it <laughs> Um, so feel free later on to grab those and it kind of spells out a lot of what they're doing. So what types of, I'm going to transition from accounts to uh, loans and lines of credit. So what types of loans, lines of credit, um, and types of financing like that are available to small business owners? What do you see the most of uh, and what are out there? I, even as a CPA, I highly recommend businesses get lines of credit just because you don't need it now doesn't mean you aren't going to need it soon um, and that just lines of credit can help so much with cash flow so especially depending on your business type you may not have just a steady stream of income coming in and so the, the line of credit kind of helps you relax in those tighter times to know okay i can draw on that line of credit I'm only going to be charged interest on the balance, and then I can pay it back once I have my income coming in. Um, to me, and that those are, you know, we renew those every year, so it's an every year thing process. But peace of mind is huge to just know that that's there in case you get in a buy. Otherwise, we, you know, mainly do the um, asset back, asset secured loans. Um, we will figure that, you know, amortized out based on the collateral, sometimes 20, 25 years. Um, but it, it really it just depends on the need and what collateral you have 
to secure the loan. But definitely look into lines of credit um, if you're in the business. Or y'all to find a line of credit for those of us that aren't familiar with that term. Mm -hmm. Go on, go on. Go on. Go on. <laughs> okay, so a line of credit, let's say you need um, business line of credit and you're just needing it for working capital, you know, buying your inventory or what have you. Pay your payroll. Payroll, payroll paying your staff. Um, so you would come in and ask for that $50,000 line of credit, whatever the number may be. That line of credit just sits there at zero until you call us and say, hey, I am needing to go ahead and make a purchase of inventory or pay my staff this week. Can I draw 15,000 of that? We say, absolutely. We put that money in your account that day. It's ready for you to use that day. So now your line of credit has a $15,000 balance that you would pay monthly interest on. Usually it's monthly, sometimes it's different, but most of the time monthly. So, you're only paying interest on that 15,000, not the 50,000. And let's say the following month, you pay that entire 15,000 back. So you're only paying the interest for that short amount of time that you've actually drawn that balance. So it's a revolving line of credit. It's not meant for you to get it, spend all of it, keep that balance for a year, and then have to renew it at the following year. It's meant for you to draw, pay back, draw, pay back. If you're if you're needing something that you're gonna not pay back over time or you know within that year, then we would want to look at a different product, a term loan, or you know, some yeah, if you were buying it. equipment or something, you would want that to be, you don't want that on this, you want that <laughs> on a, a length of time. And why is that? Um, it, well, it really defeats the purpose mm -hmm. of the line of credit. Line of credit is to use as you need, uh, knowing that, that cash comes in and cash comes out. And how do like interest rates play into that line of credit versus a traditional loan? So go ahead. I do the line of credit. It's variable rate um, that's based off prime. I mean, it's different everywhere, but, you know, I would say 18 months ago, we were fixing lines of credit at Five, well, that's a thing in the past. So now there are more revolving lines, which I think is good right now because hopefully interest rates decreasing in the future, your rate goes with that. Um, so it's not just fixed. Um, but as far as like if you were saying you want to buy a tractor, that's going to be a fixed rate loan for the term you go in anywhere from one to five years. So and that's really the maturity date. So mature in one to five years, you renew it. But your payments are based off your seven, ten, five, just kind of depending on what it is. You know, obviously real estate is a little bit longer term, like she mentioned, 25, um, but your equipment. So it just it it's easier for the customer to know if you're buying a tractor, your payment's gonna be X amount each month for this amount of payments versus you're buying a tractor on a line of credit, you know, the interest payments, you're not paying that asset down and with equipment it does have a useful life so if you finance it on a lot of credit and you're just making interest only payments it may take you five ten years to pay that off or the equipment's not useful by the time you get it another important reason that you want to use the line of credit correctly as far as drawing and paying back down is that that is going to renew every year so the following year, when you go to the bank and you're ready to renew that line, if they see that you immediately maxed it out and stayed there, and your entire situation doesn't look just wonderful, they may be reluctant to renew that line of credit. So that's another good reason to use it in the way it's meant. Because remember, you're only paying the interest on right. the line of credit. You're not making the principal touch. So it helps with your capital uh, on a month on a required month. So speaking of it to that, like wanting to remain in good graces with the with your banker and like it'd be a reciprocal relationship. How do small businesses that want to position themselves to be able to access capital, how do they position themselves to do that? What are some tips and tricks to get your business in a place where you will be able to access a line of credit or a loan? 
I would say number one is don't overextend yourself debt wise, because um, that's something that we look at. Even if you know you may have three loans at First Security and a loan at First Community, we're going to ask for a debt schedule at Simmons. So we're going to ask for you know what other debts you have. And a lot of times, unfortunately, if you know somebody's coming to us and they have fifteen loans at different banks, it's because they've been overextended at another bank. Um, so. You know, pay attention to your debt and cash flow as well. And that's where those lines of credit come in. You know, the only thing that makes a loan payment is cash at the end of the day. So that's something that we look for as far as on your personal financial statement, which is very common um, that we ask for. But, you know, cash flow and I would say debt load are uh, two of the most important things that we look at. Um, make sure you file your taxes. Um, she can speak more to that than I can. For many reasons. But um, just a good Yes, just a good idea. The government, <laughs> the you know, active, really. Yeah. Um, but you know, a lot of times in your loan agreement, we will request tax returns at a certain time of year. And so, number one, making sure that you file them because as a banker, if you know you we're past the personal <laughs> tax return deadline and you haven't filed filed them, then that's questions being asked. Same thing with your business. On a business is different time of year, so you get extension and things like that. But um, taxes, debt, and cash flow is what I would say. We want to know that you're responsible and that you're going to repay that loan and follow the terms. So if we see that you're two years behind on filing your tax return and paying your taxes, that's an automatic oh goodness. You don't rent. Yes. What else is happening here? Um overdraft and NSFs. Even though it might be every month or a little more than every now and then, it matters and it's getting better. So there uh, the banker is looking at, and not just bankers, other people too, who are looking at their financial situation. If they're seeing a lot of overdrafts in SF fees, um, which is when you're not having money to cover what you've gotten out for payment, um, it's just kind of an overall of how you're handling your finances, and it's it's not a positive. Um, that is something that I've seen in the accounting world and in the banking world already is it's really another best practice to report all your income on your tax return. Um, there's lots of cash businesses out there and that seems like a great idea at the time to, oh, well, it's just a little bit of cash, a little bit. That I'm gonna just 50 to yeah, 50 yeah. grand or something that I'm just gonna keep on the side and not have to pay taxes. Well, when you go to get a loan and you're not showing income and you're not showing cash in the bank, banks have requirements and regulations they have to follow. So if it's not there, it's not there. And we can't say, oh, but I know they have. For their mattress. Right, yeah. <laughs> the mattress or oh, oh, I know they make women. Right. And, and it happens every day that somebody comes in and they bring their tax returns and they say, well, you know, I don't show everything. <laughs> well, you know what? I pay my taxes. So first of all, you, you know, I don't have a choice that comes out of my check. Right. So sometimes you offend the banker right off. By that. But, um, but it is something we hear every day. And it is, I mean, it is really important to do that because it will... It will bite you in the rear, uh, coming down down the road somewhere, whether it's with the IRS or your bank, or bank. bank. one way or the other. It can, it can bite you. yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, bite you in the rear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was that's the last one. Um, <laughs> um, from the pen. So, what <laughs> types of information should small business owners prepare? Like, if they're wanting to go in. To pursue a line of credit or a loan, what kind of information do they need to be pulling together? If they want to look at or do they need to pull stuff together? What you know, what do they need to do? It, it depends on the loan request. Um, of course, larger loans we need more documentation for those types of loans. Um, but I would say at minimum, you know, your articles of organization, your um, bylaws or your operating agreement, um, entity documents is what we call it. because we need to as a banker like she said we have requirements and we need to know that we're lending money to a legitimate business um i'll give you a little secret on the back end of banking is we will always we are required to pull a certificate of good standing um which is through the secretary of state so if we get in there and we see that your business is not in good standing we can't make a loan to you 
And a lot of times it happens more in the fall because that's the time of year when those fees are due for your LLC taxes and things like that. Um, a lot of times, you know, people are running businesses, they're busy. A lot of times it's, I'm so sorry, I forgot. Um, but that is something that we're looking at. So your entity documents, um, depending on what your loan request is, if you're going from maybe one bank to the other, or you're working on treasury management, which is just going to help you do more of your day-to-day -day banking. You know, we want to see what your current volume is on your checking account as far as what type of transactions you have. And, and I know that can seem intrusive sometimes, but a lot of times for us, it's just we want to see what you're doing so we can make the best recommendations for you. Um, tax returns, of course. Um, really just anything that's going to give us a good picture of your business. Melanie hit it on my head when she said a lot of times business owners are busy running their business. Mm -hmm. And one, they may not enjoy doing the financial part. Get that? I see it all the time. But, and it's easy to push it to the side. Making sure your finances are in order and current is probably one of the most important things. One, to run your business by. Um, and for when the need of um, a loan arises, you already have your financials, you've got your tax returns, those are ready to go. The other important piece of that, depending on what kind of loan and what business you're in, is projection. If you are, um, you know, what, what, I'm trying to think of a specific example, but, you know, what are you expecting your sales to be? What are, what are, what's the past? But what, do you see going forward and why? You've taken on a new client. You um, find another location. Right. Yeah. So knowing the projected, so we see your history, but we may be already half or three quarters of the way into the next year. How are things going this year? What are you expecting to do income-wise and expense-wise going forward? So keep those interim statements as well. Um, we typically require them in agreement, you know, not to be so far, at least six months, you know, do a mid-year um, profit and loss statement. Use software that will probably, most of them actually prepare it for you, so you can just go really yeah. careful with that. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's another thing. QuickBooks is very helpful, but if you, if it can be a little um, misleading sometimes if you don't know what, what's actually happening inside the books. Um, I remember something I was going to add when you said that. Oh, um, profit malls, absolutely. The other side of the profit malls is the balance sheet. And that, you, you don't really hear a lot about that. That's also very important because your profit loss is going to have your income expenses, but your balance sheet has your assets and liabilities, what you own, what you owe, and then your equity. So just know that that is part of the financial, your balance sheet and your profit and loss, or sometimes it's called it. I'm sorry, I'm getting more into CPA. No, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> like she said, those those financial documents, a lot of times those they tell a story. story. Yes, they tell a story and they're part of your loan agreement too. If you are to get a lot of credit or equipment, real estate, whatever it may be, they're part of your loan agreement. So there's, you know, usually the spring and um, you will always probably hear from your banker before year end. <laughs> um, but in quarter end too, because we, you know, we have obligations as bankers to fulfill what we call our exceptions. And so what that is, is either things that are in your loan agreement as far as a p &L or a balance sheet, things like that. So anytime we reach out, Yes, insurance. Anytime we reach out for an updated financial statement, you know it can come off as, as intrusive, but we really are just making sure that we're doing our job by honoring what's in that loan agreement that you signed at the time. Well, I'll add one little thing. Your uh, a line of credit doesn't have to be a big number. Uh, it can be something so as as a five thousand dollar line of credit. If right. your if your business is small and but seasonal or even just up through the month that okay you get um all your invoices come in at this time but then you have to turn around and invest in something else 
uh, later in the month. You know, that's okay. I mean, we do a lot of $5,000 uh, unsecured, uh, $10,000, something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of us have mentioned the big uh, C word is your personal credit. You know, we oh, yeah. your, your credit score does matter. So um, even though you're getting a business loan, your personal credit is just as important. Let's take into that a little bit. So talk about personal credit versus business credit. Do, do loans report on those? Do they not? Do y'all look at both? What are, how are those there's no together? such thing as a business credit score, really. You know, there's not like you enter something in it and TransUnion gives you a business credit score, really. So um, your your score is your personal, your, your business is all these documents we've mm -hmm. talked about. And, and a lot of banks don't report uh, your customer, their commercial loans to the credit bureaus, so they may not even show up out there. But um, we can tell by looking at your income statements, your balance sheets, we can, we can figure out whether you're making payments or not. So I want to transition um, a little bit outside of the traditional account or loan. What are ways that your businesses can serve small businesses outside of those two, kind of just having a business account and having loans and lines of credit? How else can you serve those? Um, I know we do, and I'm sure that you guys have a similar version, but like the cash management service, which allows you to um, draft someone's account or put money in with someone's. It, it allows you to help manage your money. Um, Remote deposit, if your business were to get in a lot of checks, we there's a machine that sits on your desk that you run those checks through and it immediately is deposited into your account. So you're not having to take time away from your business to go make a deposit. It's all right there and you have a copy of those checks. Um, give some more examples. I know there's a bunch of products out there. Right, there are. Um, there are. Most banks even have a product that would take the place of a QuickBooks even built in their system. I know we do, um, it's fairly new, uh, but it will actually even do invoicing and stuff there for you. And so go ahead and talk to the banker about really what your needs are. I know I had a customer who was a small one man shop. He was spending $85 a month for uh, uh, QuickBooks and how he was using it our $30 package was could do everything he needed it to do. So and he had a person that he could call. Yes. If yes. there was an issue. Exactly. And it was just like, that just, you know, $50 a month was a big savings for him. And, um, and that having that personal relationship, um, you just can't in a business. I just can't expound enough the importance of having a relationship with the banker. No, similar to what Lori said, um, you know, we offer, we call them business bundles at Simmons. Everybody has them. Um, it's treasury management light, which treasury management is exactly what it says. It is cash management. Um, you know, one thing I've had a customer before that very similar, small men shop, um, kind of grew a little bit, was still handwriting checks, um, came in, we just visited, sat down, um, and he he was a little older, um, so he was very unsure of technology. Um, but just sitting down and showing him how I think our business bundle might have been fifteen dollars a month, um, which was cheaper than the amount of checks he was having having to order. Um, but also our business bundle allowed him to send to pay his people electronically through ACH. So not only did that save him money per month, it saved him time from actually handwriting checks. Um, and then it also, you know. When you're not sending a checkout with your account number on it, then that's less times that your information is getting out in the world. So um, we don't ever want to think about that, but fraud is very real, it is worse now than it has ever been, even in just class six years of banking. Um, so services like positive pay, um, what that is, is it depending on what platform you have, every bank has, I'm pretty sure every bank has it. Um, it's just how it's set up. The positive pay is where you as a business owner enter in the check number and the check that you wrote and it's when it is presented to be cash then it's okay that it's cash so say you wrote a check to joe for a thousand dollars well 
somebody got that check from Joe, counterfeited those checks and was trying to go around and cash them, they wouldn't be able to cash because that check number wasn't entered in the pay. So, and I will be honest, I did not realize how common that was until I started working with the bank. It is amazing. Like Banks people, get robbed every day, just not in them. Yes. I mean, people taking checks out of the mail. I mean, it's really kind of crazy how often it happens. So the more you can protect your account number and your personal information, absolutely. So transition just kind of into our next question, which is about how can businesses protect themselves from fraud and cyber attacks when doing money? Let me, I'm going to start with that because yeah, I'm all jump at the same time. Yeah, it's a real, I mean, it's, you can tell we deal with fraud a lot. A lot. It's, a, it's a hot spot. Um, so when you're giving, depending on your business, I'm going to use a customer uh, of mine uh, that has money coming in and out ACH from uh, 30 different customers, 30 different businesses a day. Uh, or a month, we'll say a month. It's an insurance broker, so he's an independent. So he's got things coming in from auto owners and things coming in from farmers union and all those things in and out of his account. His account is only as secure as theirs. So no matter what he does to uh, lock down his stuff, he's still giving a bunch of people permission to come in and out of his account. And these are people that companies that you think because of their status that they have the secure things in place. It, it doesn't always uh, play a role there. So not only the positive pay for checks, we have the same positive pay for ACH. So if you have those transactions coming in and out, and, and let's just face it, that's where people are going. I mean, the number of checks that are written there used to be actual I knew I'd get it I'd say that how it used to be but there used to be like check vendors that actually came to the bank and called on you and you know asked for your business because there were, there were competition in where you ordered your checks so it's so <laughs> funny and now nobody orders checks and uh so you know it everything is more electronic which just it does open a lot of doors with but it also uh, you know, the convenience factor is worth it, but there's ways to do it. So make sure you take care of your stuff, but that you also make sure that whoever you're giving your stuff is the best you can. And you use whatever tools the bank has, ask them, what do you have to protect me? And what are the rules if I get hacked and how do I fix it? Because it is not, if it's going to happen to you, it's when. Um, to, so not to scare everybody, but has it happened to anybody in the crowd yet? I've been around long. Okay. So see, yeah, never do I speak that it hasn't happened to, to someone. And so, um, it, I mean, it's happened to us. You know, it's bankers as well. So look at your account every day. Yes. Pop open your account. Um, I was, I called on a prospective customer one time. He had not looked at his account in a six-month time period, finally logged on. So someone had embezzled $130,000 from him, and he had no idea. And that would be nice, right? Yeah. Not even <laughs> literally. <laughs> well, he finally went after it. <laughs> And and the other wanted to blame the bank, you know. And it's like, uh, okay, um, we had, and it wasn't my bank, but that bank had no idea that that fraud had taken place. And so it is your obligation uh, to look at it and report it immediately, whether it's a simple personal debit card, a check, any kind of, of either account, personal or business. And we used to, when you, we would say, when you get that a bank my statement payment. in the mail, make sure you reconcile your account, which now I know most people don't even reconcile anymore. That's a whole other soapbox. For me. But, um, so, but now we, it's so easy to just open up your phone and flip through what activity has happened so that you can catch it immediately and not when you might look through your bank statement. 
But the quicker it can be called, then the quicker you're not going to be losing more money. Um, also, and it's probably the same for all of us, but we have alerts that you can set. So if a transaction happens on your account that's over a certain amount and you set that parameter as far as whether it's $100 or $5,000 or $100,000, whatever makes sense for your business, so that you know is not ordinary for you, then you will get an alert, text, whatever you sign up for when that when a transaction over a certain amount happens. Um, also, uh, an alert, um, I get one every morning for what my balance is. I know where it's about supposed to be. So if it's not there or something's you know out of whack, definitely Ooh, open it up. I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but you're looking at your account. So it's just another, another oh, safeguard yeah. to just have that number pop up and go, okay, I know that's about where it's supposed to be. And then later on, look through your transactions. And I'll obviously agree, second, third, all that. Mm -hmm. um, but just the other day, I had a customer, um, I did a construction loan for her. She has an account with Simmons that is specifically for construction draws. Doesn't use a debit card very often, writes checks, just have that paper trail. Um, and I logged in, I was doing a transfer from the loan to her checking account, and I saw like 10 transactions from Branson, Missouri. And I know for a fact they weren't in Branson, Missouri, because they were in Marshall, Arkansas, building their house. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not, um, you know, and that was just within a day. I mean, it just, that was overnight. I think it was like a Thursday night. I was just looking to see, to make sure things had gone through, and that was within that day. And I know she had looked at that account that morning because we had discussed making sure that the balance on the loan and all that good stuff was the same. So, I mean, it can happen very quickly, um, which for us, it was, you know, another feature I mentioned the alerts is the locket feature for your debit card. If you see something suspicious, a lot of times if you use your debit card, it will just say, you know, $30 for something. Well, you know, you may not know what that is, but then the next day, once it posts, it may have the actual vendor's name on it and it may be the actual cost. You don't always know um, if something's going to show up different once it posts. So there's lots of features that every bank has um, as far as alerts. Um, I mean, there's things on my online banking that I don't even know how to do or understand. <laughs> and I work for a bank. So, well, and here's the tip that I tell people to do that I actually do not do myself. Uh, but use a credit card when you're buying things online. It's not real money. I, your check, your debit card is real money. Meaning, so mm -hmm. if you have fraud, a bank has 10 days to give you your money back. That's 10 days that you might have zero. And that's a long time if you can't buy groceries. So, um, you know, it, it, it is it is very good to, you, to use. Especially at gas stations. Gas mm -hmm. stations. You don't use a debit card at a gas station. Yeah. And I did yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> not an if, it's a when. Yeah, so gas that. stations, those little things you slide, they are they are so easy to put a skimmer in there. And uh, so what they do is they literally, the whoever put them in there, they're electronically capturing your debit card. And they just scan them. Yeah, it. and the Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Yeah. Um, so let's say someone did fraud happened on the debit card, you saw it. What what does the bank do? What are what rights do we have as the person that had this money stolen and what do we not have? You know, I what are the steps to like try to fix that? What happens? A bank technically again has 10 days to refund your money. Um if you report it. Okay. You know, it, the main thing is you have to report it. If you don't report it, what's the time? That you have to it depends. It. ACH is typically within 24 hours. Um, debit card transactions within seven days. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's changed days. since I was on a retail side. Yeah, it, that, that is something because of the broad frequency, the laws are changing often. But um, uh, typically, you'll get everything back um, unless they find you were negligent. So a big a big negligent would be okay. We, uh, some you, you know, your somebody took your car to the ATM um, and used it, or made their made an ATM card. So many times, it's not as bad as it used to be, but the 
I mean, we would we can pull up and see who used that card, at the ATM, and and it's their some member of their family, you know. And so then they go, and we're like, do you, would you like to press charges against the person? And it's like, no, no, thank you. Uh, so um, that was, I don't see that quite as much as I used to, but uh, that was always funny. A question um, virtually. We have someone saying, as someone who has served in the military, they talked about veterans administration, small business loans. Is this something that you deal with or know about or what veteran benefits do you guys provide? We have, um, depending on the let's loan look type. At, yeah, <laughs> let's look at the loan. Um, I know we have mortgage loans. I don't do mortgage loans personally, uh, but we have specific loans for veterans um, on the mortgage side. Um, SBA, Small Business Administration. I don't personally do SBA loans. Um, I work with a partner at Simmons Bank who is an expert in SBA loans. Now, I've, I've learned a lot just through working through them and those types of loans. For example, if you're working with me, they are still in like my portfolio. So it's not that we're handing you off to someone. Um, SBA loans are regulated a lot differently than just a conventional commercial loan. Um, so we do have people that specialize in those SBA loans. And a lot of banks are SBA affiliated. So uh, more now than I would say probably three to five years yeah, ago, just almost because very good. Because of their need. Um, so there are lots of great program. Yeah, lots of resources. Whether it's different or not. Yeah. The small business loan, the small business administration in general is, is a great resource. The VA loans will be more mortgage based, but yeah. there are government programs like the SBA loans that are available. Correct. Yeah, and there might be some like grants and some other SBA, VA stuff that is not run through a bank. Right. Um, I, I don't know of any. Um, on that side. So um, that is probably something specific to this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Dealing with debit card safety, how about the tapping feature? Is that safe? Um, or safer? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, none of us really that safe, yeah. but um, it, it's just fine. I mean, the difference really is, you know, if, you, if you're just doing your tap to pay, flip your card over to where your card number is not visible to the person that's over your shoulder. Um, and then also, you know, be mindful of just yesterday I was at the gas station and there was someone so close to me breathing on my shoulder that I just opted to run my debit card as a credit because they were so close to me. I was like, they're going to see my pin number. Um, so just being aware of that, but the tap to pay, I've seen that's the big difference. You can't flip your card over to where you're not showing your debit card. Yeah, but the connection though, is that safer than the swipe? It's not the same. It's the same. And 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 I'll say, you know, those those terminals and stuff are really safe, fairly safe. I mean, very safe, I would say. It is um there's so many connections that go between say a business so let's just pick target or not picking on target because i'm i don't know that i've never had a fraud there or anything but so target they've got their database of stuff and they then they talk to visa they talk to mastercard they talk to american express they talk to all those things so there's all these connections that um and switches that are involved in who touches that transaction. Yes, it may have happened like this, but your card's being saved along all along those lines. And so, you know, somebody taps in way down here, it doesn't necessarily, it's not what happened at that card reader. Mm -hmm. So I feel like to sum all that up, there's only so much we can do to protect ourselves when we're out shopping or getting what we need, but what we can do look at those accounts, yeah. transactions daily, and every now and then look at your credit report. And, and yeah. there's so many different ways you're able to do that for free now that um, it's and a report, it. And a report, annual report, annual credit report. Annual credit report com. You can look annually uh, for free. Please, yeah, please do that. Uh, and, and also Credit Karma, I'm not sure exactly how they calculate, but typically their scores are a little bit different than TransUnion and Equifax and those things. But um, it's it, 
I've never run in a credit report on something on someone that there wasn't something out there. Uh, and maybe it really was them, but it was something that somebody did for them. You know, like, okay, I bought a, my son-in-law <laughs> that hadn't been my son-in-law four years ago and had a phone and didn't make a patent. You know, little things like that. And, and that's one way to build some customer loyalty when you run a credit report on somebody and they go, okay, you have a charge off to AT&T for $48 in this time period. And they're like, I had no idea, you know, and so it's derogatory on their credit report. So they pay $48, get that cleared up and move on, even though it really wasn't theirs. And so in compliance with, let's say my business debit the car, and then it's also tied to QuickBooks. So that's a way to show proof that I'm actually using my business checking account for business transaction. And so with, and I know you know, you used to say about using a credit card, but if I'm trying to prove and keep uh, records, you know, that I'm using gasoline, that I had a client fed bill, um, I have to fill up, well, fill up well, I, I do now, which never mind. But let's <laughs> say lunch was part of me with a client order like that on um, a Chick fil A. And so I'm just kind of, kind of concerned because I've been using my debit card, this debit card, so to show up in my QuickBooks and all things are aligned to the IRS. Or like my old CPA right there, we know I'm doing the right thing. Yeah, there's lots of ways to spend money. So, okay. so yes. what what you're doing may be absolutely fine. Just double check your activity daily, Every day. and then you wouldn't have a need to change anything. But right. just know there's probably other ways. Um, I think QuickBooks will let you connect with a credit card also, so you would have that capability. Um, lots of ways to prove to the IRS that it's business related and two you can get a credit card in the name of your business yeah um like customer, yeah whether it's called business award whether it's a full corporate card um you know you can have and you can have several cards on that account so how business credit card works is say you have a fifty thousand dollar limit for the, the business as a whole you can have three or four cards that have maybe a thousand dollar limit and you can set it to where it can only be used at gas stations um, so there's lots of letters. They're very, very intuitive. You yes. can get down on a credit card. Yes. Or if you, when uh, you have a, a staff that you want to get, they mm -hmm. can only buy gas with it, or they can only buy office supplies or whatever. And you can typically control their card online, shut that puppy down as soon as they can. <laughs> <sign up. laughs> right. Then you get the points, right? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. So just like the line of credit that we talked about, you know, a business credit card is also very good for, like you mentioned, lunches, your travel, your hotels, um, things like that, because that's just another piece that's keeping that separate from your personal. Um, there's cashback rewards. I mean, every credit card basically does the same thing. It just may be this one's two points, this one's one and a half points. Um, and I will say I'm a huge advocate for credit cards through your bank. Because if something goes wrong, if there's fraud, anything like that, you have a real human you can come talk to versus somebody that is in a different country if you have a Discover business card. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just saying that. <laughs> Huge advocate for having a credit card. So when you bank. come in, open up your checking, your business checking account, you can get, you can fill out your business credit card right there. Um, and and use it like that and a lot of times it will actually show up on your online banking and so you can actually see it and make your payment there and all of that and so you're not dealing with someone really far away no. and then we write it into you know the suite of products that we we have so uh in, in terms back to the fraud deal um is there any way we to scared all of y'all today there's good straight uh, so, like, in terms of verifying fraud both ways, so say someone gets fraud, like, like hacked or something, and there's fraud, fraudulent transactions, whatever, or whatnot, um, but then on the flip side, is there any way for the person that's, like, undergoing fraud to, like, falsify that fraud, um, oh, where, okay. like, say... They go to Dallas for the weekend or something, spend a bunch of money, and then they're back the next day and they report, oh, fraudulent transactions. Is there any way to verify that? 
Yes, and I will tell you that's what the fraud department does. Um, that is not what I do. <laughs> um, they're sneaky. They are. They'll be posting that on Facebook. Yes. <laughs> you heard that uh, one. Most all yes, most all banks have a fraud department that is dedicated to that type of thing. So if you have fraud on your debit card, you go to your bank, you put in a dispute. Our fraud department is going to investigate it. Um, that's what that ten day period's for. Correct. It's for us to investigate. Yeah. We don't just. Hold it for 10 days for fun season. <laughs> yeah. So, like you mentioned, there are cameras at ATM. So, that, you know, you let your sister go withdraw money. She was going to withdraw 20. She withdrew 500. Um, that's on camera. Or right, a bunch at Walmart or whatever. I mean, yes. can, uh, you know, we'll, pull, we'll have people pull those. Mm -hmm. um, and like so, yeah, the media that just opens up everything else yes. to be able to. So, like, if someone is off social media <laughs> and they take a Dallas trip, they spend with their debit or credit card, what, whatever, and then a day later they're back in Arkansas and they report that. Do you just pull up camera footage of wherever the well, transaction it depends, was? I'll be honest, it depends on the amount. You know, it's like, okay, how much is it going to cost us to have a team of people working on that for three days? It for uh, are we gonna do that for fifty dollars? No, we're gonna give you fifty dollars and move on probably. But there is, you know, it's a, if it was like several thousand dollars. Yeah, that like yeah, uh, and money. that will get turned over to the police as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So over a certain limit, it's it's automatically turned over to the police, and they will investigate mm -hmm. that. And it, and, and if on social media you see where sometimes the police will post the picture. Do you know these people? They have been out shopping, you know, and with somebody's card or you know because they um they'll grab the, they'll get the information and they'll actually make a card on a fraud that you know says may even have their own name on it but it will have your you know your card, account number on it so um it that can be done in and, and, and anytime you swipe that card, it's traceable to where that card was used. So, I mean, we see it down to the inch. Yes, right and the time, where it is. And a lot of times, I, I just see it more now, is people will take that debit card and they'll go buy Walmart gift cards. Mm -hmm. And you can tell by the amounts. And so they're buying those Walmart gift cards. So they're trying to see how much is, how much money is on that debit card. So instead of using it and it getting rejected, they're buying several of these Walmart gift cards, Visa cards, then they can use that money wherever. And the fraud departments usually have to see it all. Yes. So they're there. Basically, FBI for the bank. <laughs> and, and to be honest, probably every bank has some former police officers that work for mm -hmm. them in that department. Correct. And is there any way to, like, for, say, someone that wants to be extra secure, um, they don't want to use a physical card at all. They just add the card to their phone and it's just scanned and then face ID. Is there a way to turn everything off except have that? I don't know. I, I wonder what the fraud risk of that, it's like setting that up and only having that, what would be the fraud to that? I think the more technological you get with it, the more, the harder it is to investigate. You know, with the physical card, like I said, it can be traced to the minute, to where it's at. Whereas if you're using the phone, with anything, if you add more technology, it's either it makes it much easier to find something or take takes our the people that investigate that a little bit longer to look into it. But I mean, debit card numbers are out there, whether it's digital on your phone, whether you're using a tap to pay, whether you're actually swiping in, or whether it's like a chip card. Unfortunately, it's yeah. not kind of how the world is. And when you're using, when you're actually using your card and it you get a text or something and said, was that really you? Don't get mad at the bank. It, we're, we're protecting your yes. stuff. Um, and it, I mean, sometimes it comes at the worst time during a cab in Mexico. Right. And that happens Personal to me. Yeah. It's fast. And I couldn't, you know, I couldn't say yes fast enough. It got declined. Um, anyway. Um, you know, know, I made the mistake of not calling the credit card company and flag them that I'd be in Mexico. We all do it. Yeah. So I'm going to wrap this up. It's the right time. Um, I want to end with one final question for each of you, which is all of you serve in our Connector Connect SME network. Um, and so what is, what do you like to consult on? So when someone comes in and they make a phone with you, what do you like to consult with people on? What can they find on Connector Connect and talk to you about? And then I'll start with you. Um, I, 
all of it, I guess. <laughs> I know that's a very generic answer, um, but I love, you know, people that maybe just have an idea for a business. I love to listen to people's ideas um, because, I, I mean, they think of things where I'm like, what am I thinking about kind of things? Um, so I love to just meet with people and just kind of talk about like what ideas they have, bounce around how they would get that started. Um, secondly, one of my favorite things to do is help the small to medium business. Um, like Lori mentioned, that five thousand dollar line of credit. When you get to sit down and meet with somebody, and you know they're just they're having a cash flow issue, and it's that they get their invoices, they have to pay them in. But as you grow, you go through what we call those growing pains. And those growing pains are maybe you have a lot of job requests, but you don't have enough people or you don't have enough cash in order to buy the materials to keep up with the demand. Um, so that either whether it's a five thousand dollar line of credit or a hundred thousand dollar line of credit, those are kind of those are my favorite people to meet with. Um, just it's you know I want to know what your heartburn is day to day. You know what are the things that keep you up at night. What is, you know, if this one thing could be easier to get you some time back, like what can we do to do that? And a lot of times that that's very fulfilling for me to take that one thing that is just stressing that business owner out. Um, I'll give an example. I had a customer that, uh, you know, they just could not keep up with emails, phone calls, all these other things. Um, and so they we ended up getting a line of credit so they could have their niece come work in the office. Um, since it was family member, she was just worried about that extra expense of paying somebody to answer phones and the emails and things like that, um, taking away from that extra cash flow. So just that small $15,000 line of credit allowed her to hire somebody to be more efficient, to keep up with the demand so they weren't missing out on revenue for the business. I second that. Um, also, I enjoy getting to show especially new business owners because sometimes that's mm -hmm. all business owners who have been in business forever how to actually what their financials mm -hmm. truly how to read them how to understand what it's explaining to them i think one of you guys said earlier your financials are telling a story mm -hmm. um so to to see what that's telling them to know what items to work on so that they're, they look better on paper, so their story looks better. Um, I enjoy that. Part. So I mentioned briefly um, before that my background is marketing and banking, and so I'm kind of a rare breed on that in that not, um, not every banker has ever had that experience. So um, it's a little bit of an anom anomaly, but I was marketing director for basically 30, close to 30, 27 years of my 37. So I know, um, I know branding, I know um, advertising on all kinds. Um, she might know a little bit about networking. And I was going to say that. So I, I think probably the one thing that I would pride myself on without sitting here trying, I'm not patting myself on the back, but it, it, it's kind of a accidental way of stumbling uh, that I stumbled into to something that's made my career more successful is networking and um, learning who to meet with and how to do it and how to get involved and in our community and I how I stumbled actually uh, stumbled across it um, also, an advisor here is Bunny Ancock, who has been a businessman here for a long time. My very first job out of college was working directly under him, and uh, I got to see the master at networking, and I instantly realized that was a way. Of, one, I enjoyed it, so it, it wasn't painful for me, uh, and it was something that I had done my whole career, so and now the rewards of it are, oh, I need A, B, or C. I served on a board with them in, you know, 2002, or I did this with them. I have their cell number. I know, you know, that sort of stuff. And um, I would call myself probably the queen of networking in Conway. Uh, and, and now it's funny, though, that I've reached this age, and yes, I have a lot of people, but now I'm having to go back and restart because like all of you, I mean, 
there's a young generation and that's what I'm loving about being a part of this group is I'm seeing this next generation so I can make those connections and not only just share it with you, but I can learn from you as well. Absolutely. Well, thank you ladies for your time. Thank you for joining us. You can make an appointment with any of these ladies. They come in um, two hours a month. Every month at the AIC, you can do it over the phone or in person. I don't know that they'd love to talk to you. Um, go ahead and follow us on social media um, at AR Conductor on Facebook, LinkedIn, all that stuff. And you can keep it in mind the upcoming events that we have, like these. We do these events multiple times per month. Um, and we post all over social media, and all your different great that. So thank you for coming in, and we'll see you next time.